Okay. So real quick, I want to do a video going over chapter three's different gates and schematics and whatnot, just to kind of get that out of the way, because some of them are pretty straightforward, but one of them in particular needs some exposition, that being the program counter. And then I also want to give a little bit of exposition on the RAM chip. So let's go and head on over, take a look. Okay. So just real quick, Starting right off the gate, we have the singular bit. It's just a one bit register. The whole point of it is to basically store and load data. So it's the simplest form of sequential logic next to the actual DFF, but this is something that's actually provided for you. You want to make it from scratch. Um, that is simply because it is an emulated latch or flip flop and making those can be fairly complex. So that's just given, not a big deal. Now it's used in conjunction with a MUX to actually give the ability to select if you want to store or load data. And that's something that was touched on in the previous slides when I just went over the actual logic behind how sequential logic works. Now the data flip flop loops back into the MUX using a clock. The data flip flop is both the output of the gate and part of the input. Now, you can take a look at the actual schematic to explain that real quick, because we have a single one bit input, so it's gonna be zero or one. Then we have a one bit select pin, zero or one, that's for load. The data flip flop, we just take the actual input to it and pass it out for the clock cycle. And then we point right here where the path diverges into two different points. So part of it goes into the actual output right here. That is indicative of the out equals out part of our data flip-flop, right? The other part, that travels down this line and back into the MUX. So that would be out equals DFF out. So that's the output from the DFF. And then we use that as the input to A on the MUX. And the other input to the MUX is the actual overall input, zero one. Let's take a look at how this works. If we want to say just store one, pass in one, load one. So this is saying, yes, we want to load data. Let's load what we have passed into the input. It's going to go into the DFF. It's being stored. It's going to output it. So the output's one. And then our input is be back to one. The one or one, we can just choose zero. And now it's going to constantly store data in this loop. This is clock cycle. It's going to continuously store the value of one. Now, if I change this to zero, you might think, okay, it's going to change to zero. Not quite yet. So while the input is set to be zero, it will never select to use that input until eventually this load is changed to one. Once that happens, then we'll actually use it. The output becomes zero. Oops. And then we have zero here. So now zero is in the cycle. So it's constantly looping zero over and over and we store it. So that's kind of the general purpose on how one bit register works. And it's very, very rudimentary. You choose one or zero. Do I want to store this one or zero? And that's about it. But like everything else we've done so far, we can scale that up. Take a look. We can come over here to the 16-bit register, which is just going to be known as register. And it's essentially the exact same thing, except we use 16-bit sequences because we have a 16-bit computer. And we've seen a bunch of 16-bit gates, except for this one is sequential as opposed to the previous ones. Now, these have some 16-bit value. We use 17. So currently we have 17 as the input to our gate. We're going to do zero for load. Currently nothing is happening. We don't have any idea what the output is because we haven't loaded anything in yet. I'm going to choose one and all of a sudden, nope, now it's stored. Now if I change this back to zero, it's going to be constantly doing that cycle, storing the data continuously. And if I change this to 21, well, don't get that 17. We have not told it to load 21 yet. Up until we do this, now 21 gets loaded in. And then we want to store that. Change it back to zero. 
again, same exact thing. It's just gonna be at a larger scale because now we have 16 bits to work with as opposed to just one. Now note down here, multiple of these we used to create RAM. This 16-bit register is probably the most important gate in terms of the overall functionality of our eventual computer. As every part of RAM is constructed of registers, multiple parts of the CPU are constructed of registers, and several other things are also used in registers, which are kind of offshoots of RAM and whatnot. We'll touch on those later once we get to chapters like four and five and start dealing with assembly. More on assembly later as well. Now, the program counter. This is the one that needs some genuine exposition on what is happening and specifically why it's happening. So it is used to navigate our eventual assembly code that we'll be writing. It has a three-step process on what's going on. It's five different actual gates if you look over here. And then there's an actual small schematic for this, but this doesn't really show the complexity of what's genuinely happening. So we have one increment 16, and that's just gonna be used to increment our actual register count. We have three muxes, and those will be used to turn for loading data, incrementing data, resetting it. And we have the actual register because the PC is a very special type of register. It's a very specific purpose. Let's take a look at these steps though. Step one, chooses to either select our current instruction or increment to the next instruction. So that's gonna be a conjunction of these two and the actual output of the register. And then we have the second step, which chooses between the former and the input to our gate. This is used to jump to different places in our assembly code. And that'll be this. And then finally we have choose between the former and false. And that is just a static false because it'll be used to reset the beginning, taking us back to instruction zero. Now do note, this register goes back to the start just like our data flip-flop did. So it'll be constantly cycling itself from its output back to its input over and over again. That gives us the actual 10 years clock and ability to navigate through our code. I'm going to start over here and we're going to do a little bit of exposition and explanation. So assume you have some code. Just line by line and code. All right, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. It looks less like an H. So suddenly like you've written something in C and C++, maybe Python or something, and it starts at the very first line and just starts reading through it incrementing line by line until maybe eventually you tell it to do a function and it'll jump to wherever that function is it'll get passed back to wherever it originally came from and it's just there's some way to navigate the actual code well the program counter is used in that exact facet for assembly code it is how your assembler will navigate through the actual different parts of code that you've written but how does it do that well, let's take a look. We know we have an increment 16. Also, forgive me, my writing is not the best, so we'll see. You know, we have a muck 16. Another muck 16. Another one. And then finally, we have a register register has some output and then that output gets passed back to the beginning however at one point I'm gonna verge back as the input to the muck 16 the first one the output of the increment 16 will be the other input so it's choosing do I want the actual output of the register or do I want an incremented version of the output this we use as the input to this one uh, along with, oh wait, everything has a, so that's way too long. Everything has a select pin, except for the increment 16. The other input to the second one is the input to our gate, 16 bit value input. This we've used as an input to this MUP 16. 
the other one will be a static zero more specifically for the HTML language false and then this will be the input to the register we know the register has guaranteed true load because it is constantly loading in new data this is 16 16 all of these are 16 Mm. One step four. Okay. So this first one is used as increment. Next one is used as a load. The next one will be used as a reset. Okay. So this is the overall landscape for the program counter. And then this is the output. Yeah. So let's assume that we start at no. Register zero. This is zero. Pass back through. Here comes here. Increments here to one. But what do we do from there? Let me clean this up a little bit right over here. There we go. One. Okay. So every select pen is going to have some associated value. Increment here. Zero. Zero, zero. Okay. Currently, n nothing is going to happen. It's going to choose zero. Over here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and settle with 14 as the input to my gate. 14 over here. Uh, since this is always zero, that's always going to be there. Zero here. So, this again, we're not loading data. We're not anchoring the data. We're not resetting the data. It's not changing. It's gonna be that zero constantly cycling back into itself, just like our registers did. Okay, so let's change it up. Change our increment to one, but it's true. So now, instead of passing zero through, it's gonna pass one through. The one there, we're not loading, so one goes back through here. We're not resetting, so one comes through. One is the input of this register. Now we're at line one. So, one passes back through. Here's one. Now we're at two. So we're changing one and two. And we're going to keep incrementing. So now two is going to go through. Constantly. Now we're at line two. So this is the way that we will actually navigate through our code. Now, let's see. It's going to actually go back through. So we're going to choose between two and three and i'm going to increment again i'm going to tell it to increment at the very least so three get passed through now i want to tell it to load the data so now instead of using three it's going to use 14 because the load is going to take priority it's going to choose between 14 and zero now we're not resetting so it's going to choose 14. Now 14 is the input to register And we jump to line 14. So we don't go to line 3, 4. We go well beyond to line 14. And then that will get passed through. So 2 and 3. Now we're doing 14 and 15. Okay. Maybe now I just, let's say I load in line 36 or the value of 36 into the actual input 36 settled here okay and maybe i want to um want to increment right well i'll go from 14 to 15 so 15 gets passed through okay and i'm gonna load so now instead of 15 i'm using 36 and now here, I also want to reset, so everything's going to be true. But it's going to use zero, because reset has the highest priority. So there's going to be there. Let me jump back to line zero. So, even if we are constantly incrementing, and even if we are constantly loading, we might just choose to reset, because this is going to have a priority 
of say uh, zero, one, two, and away. Basically, reset has the highest priority, load has second highest, and anyway, it has the lowest one. So this is just kind of the way the, the program counter works and how you actually navigate through the eventual assembly code that we re we'll be writing. You don't have to use this directly, at least not at that like conscious awareness of this. It's just a component and it will know how to operate on the system since you've already written it. But I wanted to give exposition on how this works so you understand why we are creating this component and why navigation through assembly code works the way it does because you've written it. So with that being said, you could add as much functionality to this program counter as you want to change the navigation style of your assembler. So if you wanted to make a more complicated assembler, you could make a more complicated program counter. And then it would have more intelligent features, which is what a lot of things have nowadays. So if you want to have like look ahead and like say, I'm at line two and I want to know what happens at line five, you could write the hardware to do that. You just have to alter this chip. But we're going to write a very simple one like this, and it'll be perfectly fine. Now, moving back, we're going to move on to RAM. So, all of our RAM chips are going to work on a very similar principle. And that principle is, where are we storing the data that we want to load into the system? Right? So let's take a look. Let's say I want the value five. I want to load it. And we have a three bit input. So that's gonna be zero through seven, zero, 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 through one, one, one. And for simplicity's sake, I'm just gonna choose one for the first register or the, not, not the first one, the zero, zero, one, and then seven here because of the ellipses. So basically five is gonna be stored here. And so we max back out and then five is the output. So we just actually output the five, get stored in that register, and go about our day. Well, sort of. This is the lowest level of RAM. It's called RAM 8, and it's just a collection of eight registers. It's gonna scale up from there. Now, one thing, a very critical thing to note, this uses three select pins. And the reason is because those select pins go to these mux gates. So RAM 8 utilizes three select pins. DMUX and MUX, well the DMUX 8 way and MUX 8 way also use three, three select pins. Um, I'm saying that in preface to the next slide. So just keep that in mind. Okay. Now, there's a little code down here. You can tell how many select pins the overall chip uses. Right there, three. So DMX 8-way takes in the actual load value. Select address, notice that there is no indices. There's no indices. It is taking in all three of the select pins right here. You will notice this change on the next slide. I'll explain it. And then we have eight outputs because it's a DMX 8-way. And those are gonna be this, this, so on and so forth until this. You can see those represented here here and everything in between as is determining the individual registers of where things are being stored and then those are get boxed back together select pins get used and we have our overall output and that's the general use case of RAM it's basically just taking some data using a DMUX to determine where in the sequence of that RAM is it being stored and then taking the in up well taking the input is outputting it in the sequence of events because it's all sequential logic so it eventually gets passed back now it scales up so our registers took eight of them put them together we got ram 8 we're going to take ram 8 ram 8s make ram 64 because if we have eight collections of eight registers we have 64 registers we're going to take eight ram 64s and make a RAM 512, that's 512 registers. Eventually we'll have RAM 4K, RAM 16K, and that's eventually gonna be a little over 16,000 registers. Now, these 
scale up and the most complicated part of writing this is the address select pins. So if you see this one, RAM64, uses six select pins. We know that RAM8 used three, RAM64 uses six. And the reason being is because we know that RAM8 uses three. The three are dedicated here, 0 0.2, and three more will be dedicated to our DMUX 8-way and our MUX 8-way 16. So we're adding on three for the MUXs. So we follow that logic. RAM 8 has 3, RAM 64 has 6. We're going to use 8 RAM 64s to make a RAM 512, which means that we'll need another DMUX, DMUX 8 weight specifically, so we need to add 3 more. So that's going to be 9. So if we take a look down here, uh, I'm assuming that these are all RAM. 8 is going to be 3, 64 is going to be 6, 512 will be 9, and then we'll need 8. RAM 512s to make one RAM 4K. The 4K will need another DMUX 8-way. It'll be 12. And you look here to see that RAM 64 is just 8 RAM 8 chips. RAM 512 is just 8 RAM 64s. These all use 8-way DMUX and MUX chips. And you can see that because we're incrementing by 3 every single time until we get to RAM 16K. That's just four RAM K4 chips. So we need a DMUX four way. So we get the 16K instead of being 15, and be 14, right? So if we split it up, we have just three dedicated to RAM eight because it's just register, which doesn't have any address pins or anything like that. But when we get to 64, it'll be a three three split or three are being dedicated to RAM 8 here and here three are being dedicated to the DMUX and the MUX but then when we get to 512 it'll be a six three split six being dedicated to the RAM 64s three being dedicated to the DMUX and the MUX and then here we'll have a nine three split nine being dedicated to the 512 three dedicated to the MUXs and then here you will have a 12 2 split, all being dedicated to RAM, two being dedicated to MUXs. So that's kind of the general gist of things. Another thing to note is one pattern of the actual RAM. If you take a look at RAM 8, there are no indices, it is using the entire bus for the addresses. However, once we get to RAM 64, you can notice we have a 3.5 here and a 0 0.2 so i always dedicate the last three select pins in the sequence to dmux 8-way and mux 8-way 16. now if i take a look at it we have a you see i want to write this ram and muxes this is three dot dot five this is wait oh get the backwards zero dot dot two three dot dot five right and if i go to five twelve the pattern will continue where i use the last three pins for my muxes and since i know that 512 has a 6 3 split, so I need 9 in total instead of being 3.5. I will use 6.8, 0 0.5, like this. And then it'll continue the same pattern as we progress through 4K and 16K as well. So, all that being said, that is basically the general breakdown for all of our sequential gates it's not anything that's overtly difficult especially the first few for like the register and the one bit but once you move to the program counter specifically the exposition i feel is very needed to understand 
both what is happening and why it's happening. Or at least why what we're doing is happening, if that makes sense. And then RAM, that's pretty straightforward. Generally, it's pretty much just a continuous evolution of itself. And then understanding how the select pins work and understanding the fact that it's just taking our single register and just increasing it by eight each time. So we go from eight registers to 64 registers to 512 registers up to 4,000 registers and then up to 16,000 registers. So that's gonna be the core crux of our RAM in the overall system that we're making. And yeah, that's pretty much it. That's sequential logic, actual RAM, not a whole lot going on besides most of the program counter, but that's because we haven't gone over assembly or explained how that's gonna work. But that's what comes next. So that's why I wanna get some exposition on how that works. So hopefully everything makes sense. Hopefully you learned something and I'll see you in the next video.